There's a bunch of photographers I talk to where they'll, they'll say, well, I'm gonna go through my photos and see what I can make a print of. And obviously that can happen, fine. But nothing will get you a print like setting out to take a photo to be a print. Everything changes. And one of the things that I tell, you know, I tell all of my friends this, but if you're gonna put in the time to take the photo, ask yourself this question. What would I change if someone was paying me a million dollars to take this photo? If the answer is nothing, great. Then just do exactly what you're doing. If the answer is, I would have spent more time lighting it, or I would have spent more time, you know, on the setup or the direction or the set or more time learning how to use the camera, then you need to do all those things. You know, and I get it, you know, there's big photos like, you, you know, you couldn't, I couldn't just take the Oval Office photo when I didn't have any money, but that doesn't mean that I couldn't put the care into taking a portrait of someone or a picture of someone on the street as though it would be worth a million dollars one day. One of the things I've been wanting to do a lot on this channel is bring on people that are incredibly awesome to teach you and to show you their awesome ways. Um, fine art photography is something that not a lot of people do. Well, actually, probably a lot of people do fine art, but how many of them do it well? Um, this guy over here does them really well. This is Tyler Shields. If you don't know him, you need to know his work. He is a photographer that, I mean, there's fine art that's really pretty, but then there's fine art where I, I think of your work as really intentional and like unbelievable, like how, how the things that come out of your brain end up on photographs is <laughs> it's remarkable. And to talk, to go from concept to execution, like those are things that I think people want to do, but maybe they have fears of doing or a lot of excuses and not doing that, but you, you've done it, you do it, you've made your living as a fine art photographer, you sell prints uh, for your living, you know, and that's really incredible. I'm just going to be talking shop with him, hearing his story, what he does, and Tyler, thanks so much for taking the time to be here. Thank you for having me. It sounds so nice when it comes back that way, okay. you know, I don't normally think of it like that, but yeah, it's, um, it is uh, a rare side of the photography business, um, and for me, it was like the only kind of option I really had. Like everything kind of just led me into doing that. So I've been very fortunate, but worked very hard for it. So, Rad. Well, yeah, I'd love to hear that because, or just how we got there. Because most people, that it feels like a very unattainable thing, right? To go and like sell your prints and make a living doing that. I mean, there's people. I think now you can have a big following on Instagram. You've got your print shop and you sell them that way. But that's right. way different than what you do. You've yeah. got how many? 21 galleries across the world. 25, 20, yeah. 25 galleries yeah. across the world, um, and you're selling not just like eight by tens or 11 by 14s. You're right. selling like massive, massive, yeah. like wall size prints. Yep. So can you just give us a little bit of a background on like who is like where did Tyler Shields come from before he became yes. Tyler Shields? So I was born in Jacksonville, Florida. And when I was young, I started racing motorcycles. So I started doing that when I was like six. Uh, and then I turned pro at that when I was, I think, eight. And then I did that for a couple years. And then I started rollerblading. And then I turned pro at that when I was 12. Uh, and then I went on to do that until I was about 20. So I traveled the whole world kind of doing that. And through that, I obviously met skate photographers, which at the time that was the only thing I knew about photography was skate photography. And, uh, and then video, right? So I was like, oh, I want to make skate videos. So then I wanted to make music videos. Then I wanted to, I wanted to make movies and do the whole, the whole kind of thing. So... I'd started making skate videos, and then uh, one day I called up uh, Ghostface Killa from the Wu-Tang Clan. I called him on the phone, uh, him and many other people who I, I suspiciously got all their phone numbers. So I called up Ghostface Killa, I left a message, I said, I'm Tyler Shields, I'm, uh, I think I was like 17 or 18 at the time. I said, I'm the best music video director in the world, and uh, I'd love to do a video for you, so give me a call back. And I got a call back from someone that worked for him. And I ended up on the phone with, with him and Ghostface and I was like, I would love to pitch you guys something. So they said, great, come meet us at this place. Well, I wasn't old enough to get in because it was a bar. 
So I went early, waited in the lobby, and basically met them in the lobby, had a whole conversation, and they were like, oh, you're going to come in? I was like, no, no, I got to go to a shoot, because uh, I was probably 17. Or, yeah, and so I ended up doing a video with them, and then I ended up doing a bunch of other videos. For Wu-Tang Clan? Yeah, for, for Ghostface, yeah. What? Yeah. It was a different time. You couldn't fact check anything back then. There was no Instagram. You know, if you try that now. Is he actually the best in the world? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> music yeah. videos. I don't even Has know. Has he ever made a music video? Exactly. At that point, I think I'd maybe made one for somebody who didn't even have an album. Uh, but I just wouldn't take no for an answer. You know, I was, I was very hungry and I knew what I wanted to do. And then I kind of stumbled into photography. It completely happened to me by accident. I had a roommate who was a photographer, amazing skate photographer. And uh, I had a girlfriend who cheated on me with a photographer. And so I felt- So you shot him? Yeah, so I shot him. So uh, I felt this- With a camera? With a camera, camera. Uh, maybe. I don't know if he's still alive. But he quit photography, unfortunately for him. But I was like, I wanna document this moment. And this was like right at the beginning of MySpace and all that stuff, and so I borrowed my roommate's camera. I took a picture of like an empty closet with you know some heels in it. It was the only thing left from when I threw all their stuff on the front lawn very dramatically. And uh, I, I get the picture back because you know it was like on the end of my roommate's roll of film. So I get the picture back like weeks later, and he goes, "Oh, I I scanned like this picture. Like, do you want it?" And I was like, "Yeah." And so he gives it to me. My friend says, "You should put this on MySpace." goes viral on MySpace. Just from then on, everyone was like, oh, will you take a picture of me? Will you shoot me? Will you shoot me? Didn't know anything about photography. Didn't know what I was doing. But I thought if I could make a music video, I could take a photo. You know, how hard can it be? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so from there, yeah, I, I uh, just never stopped. I shot as much as I possibly could. I, I could only afford probably one roll of film a month. So every shoot I did um, would be about three, four pictures max. And so I would let the roll finish and then I would develop it. So I'd get 10 to 12 shoots in on a roll of film, on a roll of 35 sometimes. How much do you feel like that, like right now, if you're shooting four by five or eight by 10, maybe for an entire day of shooting, you're still only shooting yeah. about four frames. Right. How much with, with only shooting four frames because you're trying to save money and be very conservative, yeah. even back when you're first starting, how much did that impact like how intentional you were taking the photos? It definitely changed the way that I did everything uh, if I had started with digital, right? So if I start with digital, it mm -hmm. changes everything for me in terms of I'm just freely able to shoot. There's no constraints. And I think sometimes artistically constraint is amazing. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you're like, OK, you can shoot, but I can only do three or four pictures. You're not going to just be like, oh, well, do 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 You know, you're going to be like, mm, no, no, this is no good. We're not even going to waste the picture here. And then you find the great pictures th that you think are great. Obviously, I look back at some of those pictures. I had no idea what I was doing, but it made me make pictures instead of take them. Yeah. From from literally day one. There's, I, I'm trying to think, I, I, am, I consume a ton of books. Yeah. Um, mostly all business books or biographies, but I'm trying to think of, I can't, I won't think of who it is, but it was a researcher and he was also a photographer or he was a professor that he was researching. Basically what he did, he had a test for half of the students in the class. They could only turn in one photo at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. And that's what they got their whole grade on for the end of the year. The other half of the class, they, it was based on volume. Mm. They had to shoot as many photos as they could. And he said at the end of the year, the people who could only take one photograph. Mm -hmm. So this is actually contrary to what you're saying. Yeah. I, didn't, I actually wasn't thinking about that until I said it. Yeah. But the, the people that could only take one photo overthought it, overthought it. They, did, mm. they were very like... Um, yeah, it's the complete opposite of what you what you're yeah, saying, yeah. but it's, it's it's a different point. This goes more onto like creating creating, um, yeah, which can be the next move in the conversation. But the people that had to photograph like as much as possible, mm -hmm. they said they progressed so much in the year, and their photos were substantially better oh, because yeah. 
they would shoot and they would shoot and they they had to create a lot. Mm -hmm. It was like forced creation. You know, it's like if yeah. you have to like. We talked about that in, in another video that'll be after this right. one. But uh, the yeah, but that, that idea that it was just an interesting concept, but there's it's no, different, it's, but it, it's like similar. No, it's absolutely right though, because I was so constrained that it made me where all I wanted to do was have the freedom to shoot as much as I wanted. Mm -hmm. So then once I got to that place where obviously then I could shoot a roll of film per shoot, or I could shoot five rolls of film on a shoot or whatever, that was when my whole like kind of career and life really just changed and and blossomed in a big way because now i'm at a place where i can shoot as much film as i want i can do as many shoots as i want and you know it's okay like i'm not it's not gonna bankrupt me uh you know was back in the day i was surviving on one in and out burger a day and uh which was nice uh, but you know i had to really manage everything so it made me so much more hungry to shoot all the time. So when I got that ability, I shot every day. So you you gave um, tell the story about your foray into street photography. Oh, and yeah, you're up. So because I'm going to tangent off of I was this in story. I was in London doing a gallery, and we were like, all right, we're going to go shoot in Paris. So we go shoot in Paris. We're up at like. 5 a.m. shooting Eiffel Tower, crack of dawn, you know, epic, whatever. And uh, my girlfriend at the time is like, look, we've been up all night. I'm, I'm going back to sleep. And I'm like, oh, I'm going out. I'm going. I'm taking street photos around Paris all day. Uh, and so she went back to the hotel and I started walking around Paris and I'm taking photos, you know, whatever. Just, oh, here, this, that, whatever. And I go underneath the Eiffel Tower, there's like this nice little bench and there's like a crepes kind of stand in the back. And I see this old couple and they're sitting there and I go over to them and I'm, you know, speaking to them in English. They don't speak English. So I'm miming to them like, oh, I'm going to take your picture and you're going to like, move your hat. And so I start adjusting the guy's hat and then I'm like, move your arm like this and then hold this. And then I'm like, you look down here, like eyes here, like I'm mimicking all this stuff. They don't, you know, they don't know what, who I am or what I'm doing. And this was all pre-Instagram. And so I go, I take the picture. I'm like, this is going to be awesome. I get the film developed and uh, I show my girlfriend at the time. And she's like, this is an incredible picture. How did you get them just in that moment? I said, oh, no, they weren't in that moment. I, I, I told them what to do. So I tell her the story I just tell you. And she goes, that's not street photography. That's that you, you just literally are directing these people. She goes, you're just you just found people on the street and directed them. And I was like, oh, she's right. And I realized that day that my my street photography career was was dead. And uh, I had to let I had to let it go because yeah. I, 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 I just as you as you should. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. I just I can't help myself. I would be like, uh, just move the car forward a little bit and then you walk across. I just find a group of people on the street and I just try and get them to do whatever. So a lot of times people leave in movies or videos, like find the moral of this story. Uh -huh. I'm going to pause and give us a moral of the story so far or a, a, something that you can just sort of learn from or lean on mm. of the, a constant thing that you I have been hearing through what Tyler is talking about here uh -huh. is um, this is where you go from like interview to then the yeah. narrator is talking yeah great um, is uh, what what is it but there's obviously ambition but the the going after and just not being afraid yeah to ask right right not being afraid to do yeah what so <laughs> This is your interview, but I'll no, keep no, telling please, little please. stories. Is I took my oldest son. I take him to. Um, we listen to Harry Potter. We've listened to the books mm -hmm. like three times now. And I take him to Harry Potter uh, Universal Studios um, for his birthday. It's his birthday. You get a special badge on your birthday, which says it's my birthday. And they sometimes will give you things, or it doesn't give grant you anything. But we someone gave us a little when we went on our first ride. Gave us a little pass, and it got us in line, the front of the line for the next ride. And I had an idea. I was like, watch this. We're, we're going to get in the front of every line for the rest of the day. And so the lesson was we started asking, like we would ask people like, hey, it's his birthday. Like, do you have one of those passes so we can get to the front of the line? And sometimes people would say no. And, but 
from lunch on, which we, you know, basically we didn't get, we didn't yeah. wait in one line. And the lesson <laughs> that I kept telling him was, watch, do we have one of those tickets right now? Yeah. No. Right. So what happens if we ask them and they say no? Right. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. We're in the same exact position. But oh, what yeah. happens if we ask them and they say yes? We're only winning. Right, but that it made me think of that is like it never hurts to ask, it never hurts to do, and it's, it's so scary for mo like obviously some people have fear tolerance, right, 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 a little bit, you know, like yeah. more sensitive than yours, but but there's a power in going out and having it's it's not even the confidence to do it, but it's almost like convincing yourself that it's okay to like have people reject you. I think it it bleeds over to all all levels of photography. Like if you want to do big jobs, you're going to get told no. If you want to do galleries, you're going to get told no. You want to shoot movie stars, you're going to get told no. It just happens. So my thing is like a no has never bothered me. Like if I've, you know, I mean, I will literally ask people to do crazy things all the time. Uh, I'll do them myself, but I'll be like, oh, you know, we could just jump off this building and then do this and da da da, or we'll, you know, we'll blow up this car and you could just run from it. And the worst someone's going to say is no. You know, there's no harm to it. But that fear is so much worse than ever hearing no. If you're afraid to try something or afraid to shoot something or afraid to be the type of photographer you want to be because you might hear a no, you'll never get a yes. That is that is huge. And but yeah, because like what if you never ask the Wu-Tang Clan? Right. Or Ghostface oh, Killer? I called Steve Jobs. I called Bill Gates, I called Hulk Hogan, Magic Johnson, Ghostface Killer. I mean, the, li the, the list is this long of people I called. Some of them I got on the phone, some of them I didn't. And uh, I mean, like some, I got certain people on the phone and I would just be like, hi, I got you on the phone, so can I ask you one question? And they're like, who, how, what? <laughs> and they, I mean, every single person I got on the phone answered my question. Incredible. Not one person hung up because I mean they all thought it was so funny. I was yeah. like, I'm a kid. Yeah, I found your number. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so let's transition into fine art prints, right? Yeah. Like you were saying that that is like the one option that you only saw for yourself. There's a lot of options. Like sure, most people think of commercial photography. You can go shoot for yeah. a brand. You can go shoot for a clothing company. You can go shoot for like a big brand. Um, why did you end up feeling the way you felt towards Printing your own work and selling it, which then becomes fine art. Yeah, so when I I had done a couple of things, like my first like kind of big job that I got was for Nike. So this would have been 2005 or something. And uh, I was like, oh my God, like Nike called me in. This is crazy. And they called me in and they're like, all right, so we want to do this thing with you. It's going to be really cool. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to shoot a Nike campaign. And they go, yeah, so we just want you to do some photos and we want to have a gallery with them. And I was like, huh? And they're like, yeah, we just want to have them and then print them and we're going to invite all these people. And, you know, like, I think like Kobe was there, a bunch of their like athletes, basketball players, it was just full of like athletes, basketball players, whatever. So I was like, okay. And uh, they had no interest in having me do a campaign. They just wanted me to do this gallery. So you, I, I take it you already were doing. I had already work. done. I had already. Okay. I had done one gallery at that okay. point, and and it was in a. I held it in a sushi restaurant, uh, like on Hollywood and Coanga, and a ton of actors came. Hmm. Um, you know Ben Foster, who's an actor. He kind of helped me put it on back in the day, and this this model named Caroline De More. They kind of brought, you know, a lot of Hollywood. Um, and so someone from Nike had come and they were like, this kid had a show in a sushi restaurant. It was packed full of people. Um, and so I realized like, okay, they're, they're more interested in the gallery. Uh, that's fine. Maybe that's just them. And then as I tried to get any commercial work, it was like, well, you know, your work's really great, but it's a little too edgy, a little too racy. It's a little too this. It's a little too this. You know, what we need is something that's more just to our brand, you know, you have too much of a voice. Can you go and shoot a portfolio of some more simple stuff? And I was like, no, I'm sure this is the simplest stuff I got. I didn't even show you the crazy stuff. <laughs> and so 
I remembered, you know, having the gallery and people bought the prints. I mean, some of the prints were $75. Some of them, were, I think the most expensive one was $500. And uh, I said, you know, I should just do that. I should just become my own kind of entity, not knowing how big that world could be. Yeah. Um, and so I said, you know, I would rather do it completely my own way and have fun and struggle. And so for probably two years, I lived on my friend's beanbag. Um, you know, he didn't even have a couch for me to sleep on, so I lived on a beanbag. And during that time, I shot as much as I could. You know, I didn't have a studio. I didn't have, I had like two cameras. I had one little horrible film camera, and then I had a little digital camera. Shot as much as I could, shot as many people as I could. And uh, I loved every minute of it. You know, I had um, that, that same model, Caroline DeMore. She owned a pizza place called DeMore's Pizza. And once a week, they would give me a free pizza. And that was what I lived off of. I'd cut that thing up and eat the pizza over the week. So I did that for two years. Wow. Yeah. And so, because still, I think people hearing this might think, okay, you had, it definitely helps having celebrities promote a show. Sure. Like, how did, how did that even first happen? I uh, I shot Caroline, and then she uh, was, I think, dating or friends with Ben. Got it. So back then, you could go out. Like, Caroline invited me out to a place, which I had to park my car far away because I had, like, a horrible car. You know, it was the whole deal. Couldn't afford to even park there. But they get me into the Got party, it. which was, like, a whole thing on its own. I mean, you know, this is back when there would be 400 people in line. So I go into the party, and, I mean, everyone is there. I mean, you got Ryan Gosling, Paris Hilton. I mean, everyone is there. This is when everyone would go to, the, to like the same place. I mean, you'd have Denzel Washington, Prince. I mean, just literally, you'd be like, wow, I know who every single person in this room is. And I just got sat next to Ben. Uh, and so we started talking. I said, oh, I'm a photographer, you know, blah, blah, blah. So we went out to shoot. And when I shot him, which was like my first kind of like a celebrity portrait, I shot a picture of him jumping off a building. And it's just a picture of his back. And he loved it, and then he got a print of it. And it, I, I had no idea what I was doing. Like, you know, normally you'd shoot a celebrity, you're like, I'm gonna get a portrait of him, and I'm gonna do this. And I, I'm like, yeah, yeah, jump off this building. And, you know, so he fully did that. But then he told everyone the story. He was like, I did the craziest photo shoot. It was fucking amazing. Like, da da da, went, went absolutely nuts about it. And then the next person was like, well, I want to shoot with him. And then someone else was like, I want to shoot with him. And then it just kept kind of snowballing. And then I just kept shooting all these people. And then, you know, that kind of kept going. Next thing I know, I've got, you know, Zachary Quinto. I got Hayden Panettiere from Heroes. And then I've got uh, everyone's kind of showing up at my house. Like Robin Williams is coming and assisting on shoots and hanging out. Assisting? Oh, yeah. I have a great video of Robin Williams holding lights. Mike, you've seen it. Yeah. And uh, everyone would just come and hang out. And it was kind of this weird destination. And then it just sp like kind of spiraled and skyrocketed from there. But then I realized that the celebrity stuff is great, but it's not necessarily what someone's going to collect. You know, you're not really going to buy a giant portrait of Hayden Panettiere to put on your wall. So I kind of started experimenting and doing different things. Like I'd done this series with like a stormtrooper dead, you know, this was a long time ago. Uh, and I started doing these different kind of fine art things, just legs and mouths and all this stuff. And that stuff was what kind of took off. And now it's so wild because when I started doing it, you could have bought one of the prints for, uh, I think maybe $2,000, $3,000. And then, you know, recently one of them went for 30,000 pounds in Sotheby's and it's hanging next to an Avedon and a Warhol. And you're like, oh, like I took that in on my porch, you know, my old house because I didn't even have a studio. And so, you know, when you, when you see that, like I, when I, wa you know, you walk into Sotheby's and it's like the, the piece was put where the main gallery entrance is, which is where they put the $40 million dollar Picassos and whatnot. 
And that was a that was one moment where I was like, holy shit, you know, because um, it seems like it all happened so fast. Because I I don't know I don't know what happened. Like I, I it feels like a minute ago I was like surviving off a pizza, and then now I'm like blinked and I'm here. Which photo is that? That was there's a, one I did of the sixteen mouths. It's called Mouthful, <laughs> and so. Yeah, that one was, uh, and they put it in the window, and it, you know, it was, I mean, it, was, it was amazing, so. Wow. Do you allow yourself to feel proud? No, no, I don't. Not I, pride. Yeah, not pride. Um, but like, proud of yourself. Like, hmm. do you allow yourself to feel like you've accomplished something? Well, I'll say this, and I, I think some people might think that this is, not right but for me it's the weirdest thing like every week i feel like i'm starting from the beginning like i'm constantly learning i'm constantly exploring and experimenting so i don't think about any of the past uh so i never really sit around and think about it like when i do when i talk like this then i reminisce on things but um i'm always so excited about what i'm doing next mm -hmm. i'm never like oh man we like we did it um, but I am very proud of the fact that I did it my way mm -hmm. and that in the face of all the people who told me no and that it was impossible and all just people are much nicer now photographer to photographer it was it was brutal back back in the day I mean people were mean people were very mean to me when I was coming up in what regard oh they would just I mean people I remember meeting a photographer at a party once and uh, I was like, oh, you know, like I, you, you shot the cover of this magazine, like they use one of my photos inside and he just looked at me and was like, fuck off. Like that, that was it, you know what I mean? I was just like, oh, okay, cool. Like, bye bye, I'll remember that. Um, it was just never any, no one wanted to help. It's more, you know? more competition versus oh, camaraderie. Oh yeah. And I never took it like that. Like I. I love helping photographers now. I've, I mean, I didn't have anyone really to help me like that. But, um, I, you know, like Sam Damshek, someone who I talk, we talk about photography all the time. And, uh, you know, even with him, he's like, oh, you know, I love it that we're able to talk back and forth about photography. And he says even for him now, because I'm not in his generation, but even the people around him, some people are really weird to each other. Mm. And I just never understood that competition. Yeah, I, yeah, me neither. I, I feel like coming out of, most of my friends are photographers. Right. Like we, we hang out half of the time because we were on different schedules, different wavelengths, different, right. I mean, like usually gone when m most people are, you know, home and right. usually home when most people are gone and you know, right. that sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, it's really, really weird how that happens. But I think I'm, I'm more in the camp of a rising tide rises all ships. And well, now it's like, you know, I, years ago I met uh, Michael Muller. Uh, I don't know if you know who he is. So Michael's one of the biggest commercial guys. And then Brian Bowen Smith. I don't know if no, you know yeah, him. Yeah. So Brian, I lived with Brian when I was 12. I've known Brian since I was like 11 uh, and we skated together. And then, you know, years go by, whatever, we lost touch. We both stopped skating. And then one day somebody was like, you know, Brian's a photographer. And I was like, you know, I'm thinking like, they're like, Brian just takes pictures right. or whatever. I'm like, what do you mean Brian's a like, photographer? Pretty. And they're like, no, no, Brian like is actually a photographer. And I was like, what? And then I, someone showed me his work and I was like, Brian is killing it. Yeah. And then he had the, a very similar story. Someone's like, oh, you know, Tyler takes pictures. He's like, uh-huh. Because all of our skater right, yeah. buddies, everybody did everything. And then we reconnected and he was like, what are the odds? That, yeah. And um, yeah, he, he's like the nicest, most supportive guy. And, uh, you know, like he's, I mean, he's just, everyone that knows him loves him. Um, but it's just so funny because like, we lost touch for years and then came back. Yeah, that's so fun. Yeah. I would love to hear about prints and just the importance of printing. You obviously print your work for your living, but it's like, what is, what is the benefit of printing? And then even going a step further, like when you talk about the different processes of printing. Oh yeah. So 
Number one, even if you're a commercial photographer, printing your photos will make you better at that. I know I see all the time, there's all these videos on YouTube where it's like, you have to print your work, right? And you got like uh, Peter McKinnon doing a Canon ad, you know, he's just doing a Canon printer ad. And he's like, oh, look at this picture I printed out. And that is cool, you can print at home, I'm not saying anything about that, but working with a real printer who that's all they do for a living will make you a better photographer. You see a print, like a real produced fine art print, and it could be any picture. It doesn't have to be, you know, of your commercial work. It could be of your boot. You will see a photograph in a whole way you've never seen it before. Um, obviously, well, the difference even of like an inkjet print out of a printer uh -huh. versus like a print on yes. photo paper. Oh yeah, a silver gelatin or even a light jet print is a photographic paper. It's done in the dark room, right? Printing at home or printing on an, on an inkjet, you know, it's, a, it's just basically uh, just spitting onto paper and it's just kind of guessing what it should look like. And that's, and that's fine, some people print like that, but seeing like an actual photographic paper where the print is in the paper, it changes light, it changes texture, it changes the feeling that you get from a photograph. Um, and the more you do it and the more you understand it, the more you understand what you're doing with the camera. Uh, and for me, that, that changed the way that I do everything. I mean, that's what brought me to 8x10. I remember I have this photo that we did of a, of a black man hanging a KKK member in a tree. And so someone had bought the print and invited me to see their collection. So I walk in, there's a 60 inch silver gelatin Herb Ritz, and I was like, okay like that's that's a crazy looking print and then i walk over and there's the lynching and then there's dovima with elephants which is the richard avedon and it's the biggest dovima with elephants that they, that he ever made it's a 60 inch wow. and i'm like holy mother of god like i was so taken aback by the dovima from the print and I literally asked the collector, I said, what did he shoot this on? And he goes, oh, he uses an 8x10 camera. I literally came home and got an 8x10 camera. <laughs> I'd never seen anything like it. There was just something so magical about the print and seeing that. And then I, I was fortunate enough to see an Irving Penn uh, Platinum Palladium some weeks after that. I saw this, this Platinum and I was like, this is a new level of photography it gave me a feeling that I'd never had from a print before. Just seeing the platinum and the texture and, and what it did to, it was a picture of Picasso. This is his famous picture mm -hmm. of Picasso. What it did to his face, I came back from London and two weeks later I'm like, find me a platinum palladium printer. Um, and these are processes and techniques that are as, you know, as old as photography, but it changed my view currently in that moment of photography as a whole. It's like, you know, again, you only know what you know, right? So if you have only ever printed on your mom's little thing that you kind of print out like, you know, cooking recipes on at home, that's as far as you think the limitations of a print can go. You go to a lab, you have someone print you a print this big, it changes. You go to a 60 inch, you see your photograph for the first time in that scale and then you know you go to i mean a hundred inch and it's like this is a whole different experience makes your photos better makes you better but it also changes the way you see kind of all photography 100 percent. i'm thinking of people watching going tyler that's so unattainable for me sure yeah right yeah that feels unattainable yeah um and and back to that proud moment there's got to it's killer to have your work up next to right like the greats the yeah. greats of photography sure it's incredible that's where i would think i was getting at that moment of like do you ever feel proud because i think there's a difference of like pride of thinking you are amazing right versus like allowing yourself to celebrate little successes sure which that was a, a huge struggle for me that i've had to learn how yeah to do for the sake of like 
being content in life. Right. Um, and now, you know, it's like there's a difference of always ambition is good to constantly be growing, constantly yeah. be learning, constantly be wanting to do the next thing. But when you never are like satisfied with where you are. Right. Oh, that's bad. It's bad. Yeah. I agree with that. Um, See, or, or like happy with where you are. And, and it's like enjoying the journey, not the destination. You know, right, that right, sort right. Of stuff. Um, but back to printing and being attainable. Like how, what if someone is like Listen, into film photography, like how I, do they print? I started doing five by seven inch prints that were $75. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I, I think a lot of the times people assume that I kind of started where I am right now. Like I'll meet people sometimes and they're like, oh, your parents must be in the business or like you must be rich or whatever. And I'm like, listen, I drove cross country with $137 and I lived on a couch for a long, long time, then later lived on a beanbag. Um, so it was, it was not always great. And I think to answer the proud thing, I think I'm just proud that I'm able to feed myself. You know, so I'm like, oh, this is great. Everything else is just icing because uh, I can eat now. So that's nice. Um, but then when you come to printing and it, and it being unattainable, it's only unattainable if you decide it is, right? So if you take a photograph, you can find a way to print it. They're not that expensive to do. Um, you know, for me, when I wanted to make prints and I didn't have the money to do it, the reason why I, I didn't buy that new pair of shoes, I didn't go to that dinner, I didn't, you know, by whatever that thing was, I was willing to sacrifice everything of like normality from like, oh, I need to have a new sweater. I need, you know, whatever. I sacrificed all that. And I was like, I would rather take all that money and make a print. And that was me, you know, I remember the, one of the first prints I ever made, it was half of my net worth at the time, the cost of the print. And I did it. And so... You can find a way, but find a great lab. I think it's more expensive if you try and do it yourself. I think people try and think, they think they're going to save money. They're like, well, I'm going to buy a printer. I'm going to buy the ink. I'm going to buy the paper. Well, by the time you've learned how to use the printer, you're already out of ink. You're Hmm. already out of paper. And then you just got this box sitting there collecting dust. So take your best 10 photographs, narrow it down to one, and print that one. Yeah, the and I think too coming down to, I don't know, inten- you can just find photos that you've taken mm-hmm. and print them. Yeah, is one thing. But then there's also uh, your work is incredibly intentional. Right. You know, but going out there and creating work that you're then going to print. Mm-hmm. A big a big thing about that is there's a bunch of photographers I talk to where they'll they'll say, well, I'm going to go through my photos and see what I can make a print of. And obviously that can happen. Fine. But nothing will get you a print like setting out to take a photo or make a photo to be a print. Everything changes. And one of the things that I tell, you know, I tell all of my friends this, but if you're going to put in the time to take the photo, ask yourself this question. What would I change if someone was paying me a million dollars to take this photo? If the answer is nothing, great then just do exactly what you're doing. If the answer is, I would have spent more time lighting it, or I would have spent more time, you know, on the setup or the direction or the set or more time learning how to use the camera, then you need to do all those things, you know? And I get it, you know, there's big photos. Like, you, you know, you couldn't, I couldn't just take the Oval Office photo when I didn't have any money, but that doesn't mean that I couldn't put the care into taking a portrait of someone or a picture of someone on the street as though it would be worth a million dollars one day. Yeah, it's something that I try to encourage you all is that we come up with excuses. We look at your work and be like, I can't afford to like put together like the Oval Office shoot. But you can go out and get your friends Mm -hmm. and set up something in a park underneath trees in different colored dresses. Yep. And go shoot that and shoot that at, you know, F22 if you're under 35 millimeter, F64 if you're on like a bigger camera. But like you can, like there's so many excuses you can make 
oh, to yeah. not go and do it. But there's so many things you can do that cost you nothing, that are just as intentional, not quite as cool, but mm -hmm. you know. Some of my best selling photographs ever have cost me nothing to do. And then some of the ones that I've spent a fortune on, you know, you just break even and you're like, all right, well, that was fun. So it, it, it doesn't really matter. Like you don't, it, no collector that I've ever had has ever said, well, how much did you spend on this photo? And uh, no one's ever said that to me. You know, if they like it, they like it. They don't care if you spend a dollar or a million dollars, they, they like the, the, the picture. And so I think the biggest thing is removing excuses, doing and not being afraid to do, and also not being afraid to ask. Because it takes people like, you know, when I had the Oval Office thing, I, there's people in the photo. I'm like, hey guys, come on down, put these really hot, you know, wool suits on from the 50s. We're going to tape all this stuff to your face. We're going to encapsulate your pores in latex eight masks. And then once you've done that, we're going to make you sit extremely still for about two hours. Uh, it'll be fun. And I'll give you pizza at the end, you know. <laughs> but they love it. And maybe not as much that day because they all almost passed out, but they still loved it. And then I always say that the pain is temporary and the photo is forever. So whatever, you know, you might be going through, eh, you'll enjoy the photo. Worth it. Yeah, it's always worth it. Yeah. Um, why film? Not to, not to plug film or anything. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. but so, like, you, you obviously, you've talked about, like, the magic of 8x10. Sure. But, I mean, you shoot with a lot of oh. different cameras, and you six, choose six, film, right? 6'6", six, 6'7", six, 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 35, I mean... I'll because take... they have, like, Hasselblad. You've got yeah. a Hasselblad digital back. Mm -hmm. Those things can print billboard size, oh, yeah. small size. Oh, yeah. So you can make your big prints on these digital My phone images. could make a big print, yeah. but it's not the same. So... I, I don't care uh, if digital gave me a better result, I would use it. I'm not, you know, this loyalist to like, oh, it's the has to be this thing because yeah. this is what we started as, you know, some people are like that and I, I have no problem with that, but that's just not me. I'm, I'm results based and the result is the film outweighs the digital and for me, this is how. If I take a digital photo, all, all the time, we will take a digital test shot, and then we'll take the film shot. So I have, you know, the digital file. If I show you the digital and I show you the film, then you're a collector, and I say you can buy either one of these. 100 out of 100 times, they pick the film. And that's a result, that's not a 50%, have you printed them yes. large next yes. to each other? Yes, 100%. We did, a, we did this whole thing. I have this one big collector, and uh, he asked me the same question, and I said, I guarantee you this. I, I bet him the print, $15,000 print. I said, I will bet you the print that you pick the film over the digital. And he's like, okay. And so he came in, and we had them both, and I said, which one of these? Would is, you rather have on your wall? Uh, exactly. I said, which one of these is better? I said better, but yeah, which one of these is better? And he said, well, that one for sure, that's, that's digital. And I said, no, that's the film. And he was like, what? And so, you know, A, the result, right? That's, that's for me the most thing. Um, B, there is something tactile and, and uh, more connective to a piece of film in the sense of when I shoot with the 6.6, which is the, uh, the Hasselblad uh, 503, I am connected to that camera like it's a part of me. I'm controlling every single aspect of it. Anything that goes wrong with it is my fault, right? If I crank it too hard, it's my fault. If I under crank it, it's my fault. If I miss the focus, it's my fault. Everything's on me. They're, they're harder to use in that sense of you're not relying on the computer. When you have a digital camera, if it misses, you're like, why did this autofocus, it blew it, and da-da-da, and da-da-da, right? You take no responsibility. You have to take all the responsibility. Everything stops with you. Or with digital, you take it, you can see if you've missed it. You can, exactly. You can adjust. Exactly. You can take it, adjust, and... Right. 
hundred percent. Yeah. And then the other thing, my my favorite is when I do a shoot, uh, and like we don't do any tests, right? It's just we're just only taking the film, and I will get back the you know the kind of scans at the end, and there'll be one scan. So it's just like, here's the shoot, like I did, we did this one called The Kid, with the kid holding up the KKK. Mm -hmm. The whole file, like on my computer, is one thing. It's just the one scan. And uh, I mean, we did about 250 gigabytes of behind the scenes footage. But, <laughs> but other than that, it's just the one photo and a bunch of, a bunch of video footage. And you shot that 6.7? Six, 6.7, seven? Six, seven, yeah. That was on the Pentax, okay. yeah. And so, like I always, there's something about me, I always just love that when it's just like, oh yeah, this whole shoot was for one image. Um, but even- How many images do you think you shot to get that one image? Oh, uh, Mike, we can, we can tell you exactly how many. How many, Mike? Two. You only took two frames? Two. Did you, were you, were you bracketing? Is that no. what the two frames were? No, no, I took the first one and then I adjusted him a little bit. Like I think I think it was that his I think he was down and we pulled him up right so he was he was down I took it and then I said no and then he pulled up and I mean he pulled up this much and then I took it and that was it and then I mean you know like we were just like all right That's so then I I shot some other stuff to finish off the roll because there was eight frames left yeah. and then when we went to the lab to look at the film I said to Mike I was like I'm pretty sure I got it on the second one. Uh, but it's either the first or the second one. And we looked at it and it was the second frame. Yeah. But again, now here's how I did it in two frames. I went and scouted the location before. I figured out the depth of the water. I measured the depth of the water with a tape measure to where I knew exactly he would be from where I would be. I figured out where I'd be in the water. I figured out every single thing. I looked at the Pentax, I looked at the 645, and I think I looked at the square. I brought all three cameras. I said, oh, uh, uh. I said, oh no. This photo is the Pentax 67 with the wide angle lens, like this, at exactly this depth. So when the kid came, I said, just stand right there and hold this thing. And that was it. The, f the photo had already been done. So I did the prep work, right? When you make a movie, I know this is a big surprise, but that's not the first time they're at that location when, when you go to shoot a scene, right? You go to blow something up, you prep it. And so with that photo, I mean, we prepped it. I already knew the exact distance of focus on the lens. I didn't even, I wouldn't have even needed to look through the lens. I probably could have done the whole thing blindfolded because I already prepped it. Yeah. I know and that sounds crazy. <laughs> no, it, but there's there's something to, I think there's a lost art of preparation. Yeah, people in the comments are gonna be like, this guy's insane. <laughs> well, that's partially true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's what makes you so great, Yeah, Tyler. fun. The, but. P preparation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the idea of actually pre-thinking, like, yeah. Going back to the word intention, you know, yeah. there's, there's so much intention in what you do mm -hmm. that it's down to the, like, the measuring tape, you know, so that you mm -hmm. don't, you're not taking chances. Well, a big part of it is, you know, there's a variable with that photo, which is I have a kid who I don't, you know, I don't know how he's going to be in a swamp, right? And so I think to myself, I'm not going to have this kid in here for an hour. You know, you can't spray and pray. And we, when we finished the role, he was done. He was ready to get out because it's this weird swamp, he's eight years old, you know what I mean? He's like, yeah. I don't know what I'm doing here. And so I love that preparation and that takes me back to the million dollar thing. So if I thought that that photo had no value other than Instagram, I'd probably just go, you know, take some pictures, see what happens. But I treated that photo like it would be in a museum, like it would be in Sotheby's and like it would be worth a million dollars one day. And so then it only took me five minutes to take it. It's incredible. What would you, if, if someone is watching this yeah. and they're thinking, I want, I would love, my dream is to be a fine art photographer. Sure. My dream is to one day have galleries and I've never 
even printed my work. You know, what, how do you encourage someone to yeah. become that? I think the smartest, the most efficient way to do it would be to start making images if you're not already, right? Describe that, making okay. versus taking. Okay, so uh, again, setting the intention of this photo will be for someone's wall, right? And figuring out what you wanna say on someone's wall, right? So you go out and, and let's say, and, and again, I always believe that you need to kind of think of it in terms of, you need to try it at least 10 times before you know what the right kind of vibe is for you. So I'd say figure out 10 images. They could be the simplest thing ever. There's a, there's a picture of a bell pepper that sold for $600,000 in auction. So I don't wanna hear, well, I don't have the ideas because Ed Weston shot a bell pepper. Now he shot it at F390, I think, wow. and it looks insane, but it's a bell pepper. So go out and make those images before you do anything with them, before you even worry about showing them to people. We're so now in the idea of we have to market everything right away. I'm doing this, let me market it on Instagram. I'm doing this, let me, but go take the images before you show them to anybody, go and make a print. If you can afford to make 10 prints, make 10 prints. If you can only afford to make one, make one print. And then ask yourself every day for a week, what would I change about this? If you get to the end and the answer is nothing, then great, put it out. If you get to the end of the week and you're like, I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like this, then redo it. And redo it until you get it right. And there's no shame in reshooting things. I've had photos that I've tried for five years to get right. And then finally you're like, oh, so easy, I got it right. That overnight success that oh, just yeah. took 10 years Exactly, to yeah. But yeah, it's, you know, cause it's tough. Like one of my first books uh, is called The Dirty Side of Glamour. And I look at some of the images now and I'm like, I would never take this image now. I would never put this image in a book now. I would never color correct something like this now. Uh, and it's out there forever. Um, and so, you know, now I think about things a little bit differently in terms of if you can't live with it for a week, then someone won't live with it for 20 years. It's a good piece of advice. Right? With, uh, I think people, I say this a lot, but it's really easy to come up with excuses. Yeah. But what if, what if Tyler, I don't have any creative ideas. Oh, like, yeah. Tyler, what if I, I just can't think of something to go shoot. The, so, yeah, how do you answer that? In, yeah. in the idea of either like, for, like forcing yourself to go shoot? Yes. Like, and Pe what does that look like? People are way too coddled now. So it's so easy now to be like, but I don't have any ideas. It's like, what do you want? You want me just to give you an idea? If you don't but that's, have- But that's a really, it's a really big it, hindrance, it right? Is, it, it's it is, the, It's the barrier. It feels like I don't know what to do. Right. Right, I don't, and there, it, it's like if you're learning music, yeah. you're going to learn a song from somebody else, right? Sure. You're gonna go and find the tabs, you're gonna go learn right. their song on guitar, right. piano, whatever it is. And, but eventually you're going to, or like painters, you're gonna probably like paint other people's art. And mm -hmm. like then at a certain point, you're gonna go and create your own, you're gonna go yes. improvise, that sort of thing, where there's something to do this, but then it's it's really easy to look at it and go, I'm gonna go blow up a car and have someone running from right. it. That's gonna be a right. brilliant idea. Um, but I, th I yeah. think whatever world that you live in, right? So let's say that you live in, uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and you, your mom works at the uh, Olympic Training Center, and you hang out there, and you eat French fries every day after school, and you want to take, and you want to do fine art photography. Then shoot something at the swimming pool. Shoot something at the gymnasium. Shoot something that you're around. If you live in, uh, you know, Zug, Switzerland, and you know you you uh, are right by the Austrian border, go shoot a landscape. Wherever you are, whatever you're around, 
photograph that. Like for you, you have four kids, which is just bravo, thank bravo. You, thank you. But, you know, shoot the kids, but but there's so many- With the camera. Int- What's that? With, With the, the camera. camera. Yeah. There's so many interesting things that you could do where it's like, I've seen a great photograph, uh, like Annie Leibovitz, right? My, probably my favorite photo that she's ever taken is of Pele's feet. Hmm. You know, the celebrity portrait, whatever, all beautiful stuff, but like none of it makes me feel like the one she took of this dude's feet. And I mean, his feet are just, they're not pretty, but I love the picture. I would buy that picture because it, it, it says something to me. Um, she didn't think, oh, I'm going to take this and make it a print or whatever. She was like, I want to document this person's feet because she was around that. So whatever you're around, whatever you have access to, if, you're, if your grandfather has an old car and you know somebody and you want to do a period thing, it, wherever you are in the world, whatever you have access to, use that. Every time I go, like I was in Cincinnati, Ohio, I have a gallery there and I met this kid, great photographer. And he said, I really want to just come to LA. And I said, why do you want to come to LA? And he goes, cause there's so much to shoot there. And I go, everyone shot everything there. I go, these photos are incredible. Where did you shoot this? He goes, that's my backyard. I go, shoot in your backyard, man. You don't need to come to LA. You have everything you need right here. But in his mind, he was already, he needed to be here to make stuff. What he had right in front of him was amazing. And I think it was Helmut Newton that had a great quote, which is, I think it was, if you can't, if you can't take a photograph within a mile of your house, you're lazy. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Find something around you. It always feels like you've got to go travel somewhere exotic. Right. You've always got to, because no. there's, uh, and hopefully you're watching this if you're the commenter that left it, but someone in Europe was commenting on wishing that they could be, we did a video on the Salton Sea and like wishing they could be in the States, like do that. I was like, where, uh, in response, like where are you from? And he ended up being like in Europe. It's like, do you know how many people are like dying to go travel where you yeah. live to go shoot? He's like, like, he's like, I don't know. I, I live in a villa, you know, in Capri. <sighs> and you're like, ha! Ah. Exactly. Yeah. No, it, and I think that's part of it too. The grass is always greener. People always think they need to be somewhere else to create, again, just an excuse. It's, it's mundane, right? Yes. It's it's so normal to you, it doesn't feel exotic. It doesn't if, feel worthy of a photograph. If you ever feel uninspired and you feel like you don't have enough to shoot, look up one man, William Eggleston. That guy shot the most random obscure pictures of nothing in one town still to this day for his entire life. For 60 years, he's been shooting Coke bottles and random cars in Memphis, Tennessee. And I remember when I started out, someone had shown me his work and I was like, I don't get this. And then as time's gone on, I've realized like, he goes out every day and shoots for three or four hours every day for 60 years. You don't have to be a great photographer. You could be a mediocre photographer, shoot that much and get amazing things. He is, I I do think he's a great photographer, but um, he never stopped. And he never took no for an answer. And he never thought, well, I don't have anything to shoot. Have you read the book, Big Magic? No. By Elizabeth Gilbert? No. Um, Highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. Awesome. It is, but she she's a writer. She's an author, and she got uh, the I can't think of the book that she became really famous for. But after that, she's like, once you once you have a greatest hit, like, what where do you go from there? Mm-hmm. Like, how do you write the next thing? And so the whole book is talking about the creative process and like creative slumps and people talking about you know it's like I have got I've got writer's block, mm. but work creativity like breeds creativity like yes. getting out there and going out and like start like you just got to move the feet you just got to pick up the camera and start going out there wiggle the toes move the feet <laughs> bend the knees yeah stand walk run jump backflip over the train tracks but if your first thing is like i have to do a backflip over the train tracks, it ain't gonna happen it's not gonna happen if when I had started out, I'm trying to imagine myself when I'm making the 70, you know, selling a print for $75 uh, and I couldn't even afford 
to like frame the picture properly, you know, anything like that. To think about where I am now, where I'm like, we're gonna build this crazy set or we're gonna do, you know, whatever it is. Um, unattainable in my mind then. But that never stopped me because I always thought to myself, I have to go one step at a time. So I knew I wasn't going to be making Saving Private Ryan when I, you know, wanted to make my first movie. You know, it's like, it, it doesn't work like that. But now because of social media, we see people that just appear and they're massive all of a sudden. And you're like, well, that's what I, I have to at least be that big. You know, it's like validation is in likes, subscribers and all this. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Quality will always outweigh. I would take a hundred collectors. I would rather have a hundred collectors follow me than a million people who were never going to collect anything. Yeah. Is it Envy's The Thief of All Joy? Is that the one? I think but so. Yeah. yeah. One of those things. But right, Envy, something Envy like is that. definitely a Thief yes. of All Joy. Yes. Go, you know, write your own song, go walk your own path. Don't, you know. Another thing is I have a couple friends who, you know, they don't, they've lost the joy mm -hmm. in taking photographs uh, or, or making them. And uh, it's like, this is, supp you're supposed to enjoy the process and I and I never understood like why someone had a problem with struggling to a point now obviously I know my struggling was uh, not everybody wants to live on a couch you know and do that whole thing but I always enjoyed it because I it was always serving a greater purpose and it was always allowing me the freedom to be able to create whatever I wanted and so therefore I never saw it as a burden I saw it as a gift and as I started doing this more, uh, one of my friends, he was telling me one day, because uh, I, I just happened to say, oh, well, you know, there's no mistake. Me living on the couch was no mistake. And he goes, the Japanese don't have a word for mistake. They only have a word for opportunity. And I always loved that. I always thought it was so true because it's like, okay, I get a film camera, I shoot some film, it doesn't come out. I have the opportunity to do it again. I have the opportunity to learn from it, right? I take a great photo, I put it up, it doesn't sell. I have an opportunity to make another one. You know, someone buys a print, now I have an opportunity to build an oval office. Somebody buys another print, I have an opportunity to blow up a Rolls Royce. You know, these things just continue to roll. And when you look at everything as an opportunity, instead of a mistake, it frees you so much. That is beautiful. I love that. There, there's another saying that I, I really try to cling to and remind myself of mm -hmm. is just a simple changing of the words like that one. Yeah. Um, from a staked opportunity is uh, instead of I have to, it's I get to. And there's so many Great. things throughout the day where you feel like I have to do this. But if you just change, like, I have to get up early. And it's like, no, I, I get to get up early. Yeah. I have to go to this job today. Changes like, I your, get to, you know. Changes yeah. your energy. Changes everything, you know. I also just feel like it's, it's okay to start at the bottom. We live in this time now where it's like, I don't want to go into a lab because I don't know anything. But I don't want anyone to think that I don't know anything. That's, that's horrible. Yeah. Like I, I have uh, the, the guy who does my scans and everything, is, his name is Carlos. And uh, I've learned more about what film can do and what a print can be from that man than anyone in the world. And I was talking to him the other day and he was, you know, we'd, we'd just done like 96 prints. And he was just like, you know, it was a heavy, heavy week. It was a lot of printing. And he was like, I'm so proud of you. Like, you know, you, you've... I, he saw me from literally the beginning. He's mm -hmm. been doing my scans the whole time. And he's like, you know, you're just, you're, you're doing what you always dreamed of doing. And it's so amazing. And, uh, and I said, oh, thank, thank you so much. You know, like I, like I couldn't have done it without you, whatever. And he said, the, the thing is, I knew that you would be successful. And I don't know when he's talking about this. This had to have been 10 to maybe 15 years ago. 
But I sat down. He reminded me of this. I, this wasn't even a moment I remembered. He said, you sat down and you said, okay, so I don't know anything. <laughs> Teach me. And I, don't, I didn't even remember the, the moment, but apparently to him, that was like, I had no ego. I had no anything. I was just like, talk, like printing for dummies, like tell me, you know, like lay it on me. And uh, he was like, I knew then that you would, that you'd be fine. And um, I learned a lot from him, probably because I said that one thing. Yeah, how, how sad is the day or the mindset when you feel like you have nothing left to learn? Oh, I can't. Photography, you know, it, it, if you get like, you get to a point, you know, when you're starting out, I think this happens to everybody. Maybe, maybe it didn't happen to you, but you get to a point where you take really bad photos and then you take a good one and you're like, yeah, totally. right? Yeah. And then you take a couple more good ones and you're like, I mean, this is just, I got this. And then you realize you know nothing. And then you're like, oh my God, I know nothing. Then you build up again and then you're like, all right, we know some things now. And then you see an Avedon print and you're like, I know nothing. Yeah. But I love that. I love the ass kicking that photography gives you. Because even like, you know, even now, like I've used every camera pretty much, you know, that exists in every format and I've done all these things and I still learn things every week. I still try new things. Like one of my friends said to me the other day, he goes, I can't believe you've been doing this so long and you're still buying gear. And I, I was like, I'll be buying stuff forever. As long as I have new ideas, I'll, I'll keep buying stuff. Love it. Well, I really hope that this was an encouragement from <laughs> Tyler to go out there and create, to just, yeah. you got to quit making excuses and get out there and shoot. And Tyler, thank you so much for doing what you do, for being an inspiration by not trying to be, but by being you. And I think there are too few people, unfortunately, that are actually being original and doing the stuff that you're doing. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's really amazing. And so what a treat for us to get to learn from you, hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, if you haven't checked out his work or followed him, it's Tyler Shields. But um, what an incredible photographer. I cannot wait to see what the next series is. He just <laughs> did the Silhouette series. That's right, we're working on that. Um, as we're wrapping it up. But I, I think there's something too also, like you're now just like that was you had an idea but it was like a full series right mm -hmm. so are you yeah. is that the way that you're now looking at like your work that you did silhouette series and now it's going to be another series versus one photo yeah so i i uh like i i have like the historical fiction series that i did which is we did the oval office and now we just did i showed you the life magazine um so i'll kind of continue working on that a little bit and then the silhouette series and then we're going to do some more underwater so i kind of have these series that i've done over the years that now I'm just kind of adding to. Got it. And um, I think that it's just, it's so fun to kind of revisit them years later as well. When life opens up again, um, yeah. how can people figure out where your galleries are if they ever wanted to go yes. visit one of your galleries? So you can follow me on Instagram, uh, which is the Tyler Shields, um, my website. And um, probably Instagram is probably the best way because we, you know, when we have a show, we, we tend to promote it quite a bit on Instagram. But, um, you know, no, every year I do a gallery in LA, but we have Oslo, uh, London, Monaco, uh, Courchevel, I mean, Cincinnati, Ohio, so Dallas, Texas. So people look up where they are and yes, go yes, visit one? Possibly? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And, and, you know, like last year in Dallas, we had, I think we had two or 3,000 people at the opening. I mean, they're, they're pretty big, pretty fun shows. It's, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty wild. Um, but I, I, again, when the world opens up again, which who knows that will be as of recording of this, All right. uh, I definitely want to do another big one in LA. And so we're, we're kind of in the talks to do that now. How fun. So you got to come. I'm in. I am in. Uh, well, thank you so much. This was a ton of fun and can't wait to talk more shop on another one. Volume two. Volume two. Thank you.